The rules of thumb for concrete design has been a much requested topic, and today I'm here to deliver. So I'll be providing you with a skill set that will allow you to scheme buildings based on span to depth and height to depth ratios, but also going into stress limits. So allowing you to design columns and walls based on the compression force or beams and slabs based on bending moments to ensure that you have the most efficient scheme possible. Before we go into rules of thumb, it's important to understand what rules of thumb are and where you should utilize them. They are not a replacement for design, so you can't just throw out that textbook or those design guides as you still need to provide a detailed assessment on every structure. They're really there just to provide a scheming of a building to ensure you get the initial sizes correct or if you're assessing someone else's design to see whether the sizes are what you're expecting or whether you need to drill down more on the assessment. So now let's go into some of the basic rules of thumb so now let's get on sizing the depths of slabs based on their spans. So if we're looking at a reinforced one-way slab, a simply supported design will achieve a span on 25 for its depth, where a continuity you'll achieve span on 30. However, the cantilever is span on eight. So let's now get into a two-way slab design. And so if we're looking at a simply supported slab, it's still span on 25. Where if you have additional efficiencies for your continuous slab, you get span on 40. However, there is no additional savings in your cantilevers. Now, when we get into the post-tensioning, this is really where we get the greatest benefits. So if we're looking at a post-tension slab, simply supported, we get roughly span on 40. And we get upwards of span on 50 for a continuous slab. And cantilevers, we can achieve span on 15 due to the benefits of post-tensioning. Beams, typically as they support additional loads, you'd get lower span to depth ratios. So we're looking at a reinforced beam, we can achieve about span on 13 for your simply supported, span on 15 for your continuous, and span on six for your cantilevers. And again, if we look at the post-tension design, we have additional efficiencies due to the post-tensioning and the greater depth. Post-tension beam can achieve about span on 30, where if you're looking at the continuous design, you can achieve about span on 40, and for cantilevers, it's still around span on 15. If you're finding this content enjoyable, don't forget to crush down on that like button. Not only does it help support my channel, but also it works out the type of content to create for you. Reinforcement and post-tension rates is also something that's important when you're looking at pricing a structure, and they're done in two different ways. So reinforcement is typically based on the volume of the structure, so it's kilograms per cubic meter, where post-tensioning is typically done by square meterage. So it's kilograms per square meter. So when you're looking at a reinforced concrete structure, the ranges that we'll see in the slab design will be somewhere between 110 and 160 kilograms per cubic meter of reinforcement. So 110 for your lower end, such as residential slabs, However, your more heavier slabs such as commercial, podium floors, or roof structures be upwards of that 160. Now, beams will be slightly more efficient as you have a greater depth. So you have a reduced rate of roughly about 90 kilograms per cubic meter to 150 kilograms per cubic meter. So how about your post-tension rates? Well, this would be somewhere between 4.5 kilograms per square meter of reinforcement at your low end and 7.5 kilograms per square meter at your high end we still need a reinforcement in any post-tension design. And this will be somewhere between 35 to 75 kilograms per square meter, depending on the weight and how much crack control and how many trimmers and penetrations you need. And again, if you're looking at beams, you have additional efficiencies here. So you have somewhere between four kilograms per square meter in a beam to seven at your high end. And your reinforcement rates are somewhere again between that 35 to 60 range. So your low end for a residential slab will be a 35 and your heavier slabs such as podium floors, roof structures or plant floors will be your 60. When we're going into sizing columns or walls, span to depth ratios are only really there for your preliminary assessment as they're highly critical based on the loads that are applied above them when sizing, which we'll provide later. So when we're looking at minimum sizes of columns, you need to maintain a minimum size of roughly about height on 20 for a simply supported design, where if you have a continuous design which has additional efficiencies to resist buckling, it's roughly height on 26, where cantilevers are roughly height on 10. As we're looking at walls, they're typically only lightly loaded. We can achieve height on 35 for a wall, where if we've got that continuity, we can achieve height on 45, where if we've got a cantilever, that'll be roughly height on 18. So when we're starting to look at reinforcement rates, what reinforcement rate should we be aiming for? So typically for columns, you wanna try and maintain as minimum reinforcement as possible. So we're looking at a 1% column, that's roughly about 150 kilograms per cubic meter, 
where 2% column is roughly 250 kilograms per cubic meter and a 3% column goes upwards of 350 kilograms per cubic meter. Then if we move into our walls, the minimum reinforcement rate in any wall, 45 kilograms per cubic meter for crack control. However, typically based on the supporting structures and the loads it needs to resist, they're typically somewhere around 100 kilograms per cubic meter. However, if we're looking at core walls, they're slightly higher due to the loads they need to resist. So a core wall is going to be somewhere between 150 kilograms per cubic meter to 200 kilograms per cubic meter on average. This is due to the flexural reinforcement needs, the shear reinforcement, and the additional boundary confinement zones, which all add up to this higher rate. After you've done our initial assessment and sizing up the structures based on the span to depth and height to depth ratios, it's important to go back and look at the stresses that are in your structure. So when we're sizing up a slab or a beam, we need to look at the bending moments and using a factor that is known as big K, we can make sure that we've got an efficient design based on the depth ratios that we have. So what is big K? It's M on BD squared. It's a derivation on the efficiency of your design. So if we're looking at a 40 MPA slab, which is typical for slabs and beams, we need to make sure we're maintaining about an M on BD squared of five for a beam, or whereas slabs are slightly lower as they're typically governed by deflection and typically around somewhere between three. Something that also needs careful consideration is the shear that's in your structure. This is V divided by the area, so V on A. So when we're looking at the shear stress, we need to make sure we're maintaining roughly about 0.4 MPA, no more in a slab, as we do not want shear reinforcement, which adds a lot of additional cost to your design. Where beams, where typically you will have shear reinforcement due to the loads that are attracted to them, you need to make sure you do not have more than 0.2 F dash C, which is about VU max. At any force beyond this, you'll have additional concrete crushing and the structure will not be able to resist the loads. When looking at the depth of transfer slabs, there's a really simple rule, and that is to design the transfer slab such that the loads over do not punch through the structure. As if you need to have additional punching shear reinforcement, especially for columns over, it adds a lot of additional cost, and typically those depths will mean that you'll need additional flexural reinforcement in these locations as well, so you may have congestion issues. The easiest way to size up that transfer structure is to look at your heaviest column load above and sizing it up such that you do not need any punching shear in these locations or make sure that you're heading down a more efficient design. When we're looking at columns and walls, it's really important to know the load that is coming down upon it. Now we do not need to do a detailed load rundown. As we know from most structures, they're sitting somewhere between 10 kPa to 15 kPa. So how is this derived? So if we're looking at a standard 200 thick slab in a residential condition. So we've got that 200 thick slab, which is around five KPA. We had about a 1.5 superimposed dead load and a 500 square column over roughly an eight by eight grid, which will come down to a 0.3 KPA. So if we add that all together, we're getting roughly about almost seven KPA. If we times it by our ultimate factor of 1.2, we're now upwards of 8.5 KPA. But what we've forgotten is our live load. Now, typically a live load on a residential slab is roughly about 1.5 kPa to two. So let's round that down for a live load reduced of roughly one. And again, we need to times that by our live load factor. So now we've got a 1.5 factored up load. So if we add them together, now we're sitting at about a 10 kPa average on a typical residential floor. However, let's have a look at something a little bit more heavier, such as a commercial floor, which will typically be around a 250 thick slab. So this all means we've got a 7.5 kPa from the slab, a 2 kPa superimposed dead load on those floors, and a 4 kPa live load. So that's live load reduced to two. So if you add that all together, we're now sitting somewhere between 12 to 13 kPa. So based on the structure that you're supporting, you can see that we're gonna be somewhere between a 10 kPa on your lower end for a residential slab, and sitting somewhere between 13 to 14 for your more commercial structures. And by having this, we just can quickly look at the tributary area that's supported by the column, times it by the number of floors and this average KPA to get the load in the column. What stresses should you maintain? Well, typically in a column, you should be making sure that you're not exceeding roughly anything beyond about 0.4 F-C. Is there anything more than this, you will need additional reinforcement. You're going beyond that efficient design of a 1% column. And something that also should be carefully considered is if you're exceeding into those higher strength concretes, such as 65, 80, or 100 MPA. As when you're going up beyond those limits, you'll need additional confinement leagues in your structure that adds a lot of additional reinforcement. However, when we're looking at walls, the maximum stress that we can typically achieve is roughly about 0.2 F-C. And typically nowadays, it's 
you should be trying to maintain less than a 0.15 F-C to make sure you don't need additional confinement in your structure. So anything more than about a 0.15 F-C will need additional confinement leaks. When you're starting to exceed a 0.2 F-C, that's moving more towards your column design. If you're interested in supporting the channel, I have links to my Patreon in the below description. And I'd just like to give a quick shout out to my two nearest Patreons, Abe King and Anton Zugel. Without them, these type of content would not be possible. And as always, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.